Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to Beulah Baptist Church. Glad to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Matthew. Uh, we're in chapter 12 this week. Uh, so if you have your Bible handy, turn to Matthew chapter 12, or if you have it on your phone, you can bring it up that way. Um, but let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just <clears throat> thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the rain you sent our way last night and this morning, Lord, and the rain this coming week that's on the way. Lord, you know our needs before we ever even ask or think of them. Lord, we thank you for thinking of us and remembering us even when we're preoccupied and we're not thinking about you. Lord, we thank you for your enduring love. It's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so Matthew chapter 12. Um, it's 50 verses, so a lot to cover this morning. Um, but Jesus is continuing his ministry. He's continually healing people. He's continually preaching. Um, but he's continually facing opposition. Um, at every turn, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there to re re rebuke him, if you will. And the whole reason behind it, it's almost comical now that we get to look back on it. We have the benefit of hindsight. And we can we see the whole story from front to back. And we see what's happening. And to us, it's almost laughable. But in that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the top dogs. And they said more than once in Scripture that they were worried that people were going to start following him instead of them. They were just worried about their job. They were worried about their place in society. They were worried about whether or not they were, people were going to come look to them for answers. And they didn't want Jesus stepping on their territory. And that's all it was. And, you know, they, they were just looking for ways to pick at him and everything that he did. So beginning in verse 1, it says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. And I want you to imagine just walking through the fields with me. And you're just walking along, and you just reach down and grab a, you know, pull off a couple heads of grain as you're walking. And... These guys were hungry. They had been traveling. And, you know, you've got to be pretty hungry to even want to eat that. Because you don't just pick it off and stick it in your mouth. You've got to rub it in your hand. You've got to get rid of the shell and everything around it and all the chaff and stuff just to get to the, the little kernel and grain. Yeah. You don't want to eat that shell. Um, but... You have to see, though, look what it says. It says that the Pharisees saw this. Well, how did they see it? They wouldn't have seen it if they weren't over there hiding behind the bushes watching what he was doing every second of the day and watching where they were going, what they were doing, every detail. They had somebody on them constantly. They were the vice squad of their day. They had people undercover um, watching every move that Jesus was doing. So somebody saw this and reported it back, and they're calling him out on it. And just like the story of when they brought the woman who was caught in adultery and threw her at Jesus' feet, and they said, look, she was caught in adultery in the very act. Well, how did they know that unless they were looking through the keyhole? Somebody had to be spying, right? Somebody had to be watching and in order to see these things. Um, but Jesus answered. He says, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do. 
uh, it says, but only for the priests. And if you remember when Moses was dictating out the rules and regulations that God had given him about the, all the different duties of the priests, all the different uh, things to go along with the temple, how worship should be handled, all of these details. And if you've ever read Leviticus, it's full of details, but it will put you to sleep. But, you know, there's lots of details. But one of those things was that the priests, Aaron's family, were in charge of preparing the bread. And they were, they were in charge of baking it, kneading the dough, getting it ready, having it ready for the Sabbath, and consecrating it, praying over it, blessing it. And that was to be there. And we think of it as today when we have communion, when we have bread and we share the bread with each other and pass it around in communion. And that bread is considered holy. And the priests were, that was their job in that day. Everyone else had different jobs, different means of income, but the priests did not. So God made a provision for the priests that the priests would be able to eat anything that had been consecrated and given to God. So any of the bread that was left over, that was for the priest and his family. That was their food for the week. And just like with the burnt offerings, anything that was left over, any of that meat that was left over, that was for the priest and their family. That was how they ate. That was how God provided for them. And, but David here, when he was out with his men, he had been on a mission. He, it was a secret mission. He had been in hiding. They had been traveling, just like Jesus and his disciples were traveling, and they were hungry. And David came upon a, a, a Himelech, the high priest, and said, please give us some bread, anything you have. We are hungry. You know, my men are starving. He said, we need food to keep going. And so Back in 1 Samuel is when this takes place. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 21, um, verse 6. So the priest gave him the consecrate, consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. So, you know, they would put out fresh bread, you know, once that bread was, that day was finished, they would take out the old bread, put a new hot loaf out, and that was how they did it. And then the, the old bread went to the priest and his family. And the Bible says, the scripture says, that that was only for the priest and his family to eat. Now, it was okay for the priest and his family to eat, but it wasn't okay for David to eat. But it says there, he gave it to David, and um, that was that. So Jesus is calling them out on this historical event. And he says, look, remember what David and his men did? Said that he entered the house of God. He ate, he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. And he goes on there. He doesn't stop. He says, or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath? and yet are innocent. So do you see how he was throwing this in their face? If you're not to work on the Sabbath, what were the priests doing? Whoa. Because <laughs> think about it today. You know, we still consider Sunday, we, we consider it a holy day, a day of rest. Not many people do anymore. Many people don't even know what it means anymore. But who's the one that's working on Sunday? The preacher. The pastor, that's his job. He's up there preaching on Sunday, you know, when most people are off and resting. But he's working on Sunday, and it's okay for him. Well, Jesus said to the priest, he said, look, it's all right for you guys to work. <laughs> you know, how come you're innocent? Um, and my men are hungry, and you're complaining that they ate some grain um, out of the field? He says, look. He says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. But, you know, they were blinded. They couldn't see past their own pride. He says, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, 
not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. So let me share with you um, out of Hosea where that uh, quote comes from. Jesus was quoting the Old Testament. He was quoting in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It says, I desire an acknowledgment of God rather than burnt offerings. So even though all of these things were handed down in the Old Testament through Moses, really they were just outward signs. They were just there to provide an outline, if you will. But that's really not what God wanted. He didn't want that. He just, it was basically there as a framework to build off of, to let them have something to see, if you will. But it tells us here that he, he didn't want any of that in the beginning. He didn't want burnt offerings. He didn't want sacrifice. It says that he'd rather have mercy. He'd rather um, have an acknowledgement of God um, instead of people just going through the motions and coming here and doing things over and over and over and not having any meaning in them whatsoever. He wants love. He wants respect. He wants honor. He doesn't want you going through the motions and not knowing what you're doing. He, he wants there to be something that means something to you that can be felt, not just repetitive motions, not just a repetitive prayer and it not mean anything. Um, we were talking about this the other day, that how many of you say a blessing at home or wherever you are when you eat? How many times have you said that blessing and then five minutes later somebody at the table say, did we say our blessing? I know it can't just be us, but we say it so often that sometimes we don't even think about it. And is it really meaning anything if we say it and don't even know we said it? Um, do you see where Jesus was going with this? He said, you guys think you're hot stuff and you think you're so important, but you're not. And he was trying to bring attention to that and to this that had been set up. Um, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. But they didn't even realize who they were talking to. They didn't realize he was the Messiah. They didn't want to admit that this was him, that this was the Son of God. And he's saying, look, I'm the one who made it. I'm, I'm in control of it, not you. <laughs> um, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Verse 9, going on from that into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they're still right on his heels. They're right there behind him. He said to them, if any one of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Did you know that was okay? Yeah. Because that was a possession. That was a farm animal. That was something that provided income. It, they could sell the wool. They could raise more sheep, make more lambs. And if it falls into a pit, they're going to go get it out on the Sabbath. And nobody stopped them and called them out on it. So Jesus is saying, look, if any one of you guys has a sheep and it falls into a pit, you're going to jump up without a minute's notice and hesitation and go get it. And that's okay. More valuable is a person than a sheep. He says, therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other hand. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh -huh. I know. Yeah. To be able to see that, you know. I know. That's why I tell you it's like it's almost laughable sometimes when we read these stories. 
but it's serious. I mean, it, it, it's hard for us to comprehend. But here they just saw this man's hand restored. I mean, just, man, just perfect. Just like the other one. And did Jesus physically do anything? Did he physically go over there and work on the man's hand and do physical therapy for weeks and, and give him some medication? No. He was just standing there and said, open your hand. I don't think he broke a sweat. He wasn't working. But here they thought, because he healed this man, we got to kill this guy. It's just hard for us to wrap our mind around that the mindset of these guys um, that just were blinded by this. Um, verse 15, it says, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. So you have to remember, when it says he was aware of this, you got to remember, yes, he was man, but he was also God. And he knew people's thoughts before they spoke. He knows your thoughts before you speak. That's why I said this morning in prayer that he knows what we want before we ask. It's no surprise to him when we come to him with problems. So these guys, it says the Pharisees went out. Jesus was still in the synagogue. The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill him. But it says Jesus was aware of it. He's, he wasn't surprised. He knew what they were thinking. He says, so he withdrew from that place because he knew what they were plotting. It says, a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fill, fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will, in, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. So I wanted to go back to the original text. Uh, it's from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4 is what they were quoting there. And it, it's Isaiah was <clears throat> seeing a vision, and it was God speaking. God is speaking about his son. And it was prophetically. Remember, this was hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And it says, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teachings, the islands will put their hope. And, you know, who should we be putting our hope in today? Jesus. That's the only thing we should hope in. We can't hope in any political party, believe me. I don't care which side you're on. We can't hope in any politician. I don't care how great they look, smell, or say they're going to do. That's not where our hope lies. We can't hope in any of that. We can't even hope in ourselves. We need to place our hope in Jesus, Amen. that he can actually do something. He can actually do something about it. And did it say he was faithful? He's faithful. How many politicians are faithful? Um, you know, we have to know where we can put our hope and where we can. Um, verse 22, then they brought him <clears throat> a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? And I have to wonder, though, when it says they brought him a demon-possessed man, I have to wonder if it wasn't the Pharisees and the Sadducees that rounded this guy up. 
and said, here, here's some more bait. We're going to see what you're going to do with this one and threw him into the mix. Um, but Jesus didn't even hesitate. He healed him. It says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. And remember, they carried this thought and process through even when they were having the false trial and the mock trial when they arrested him finally. And they had that trial at night. They accused him of being possessed by demons, that he had a demon. And they just carried through with this idea. And they're saying that the only way this guy could do this is if he was using the power of the devil to cast out devils, not realizing what they were saying. Because Jesus is going to very clearly rebuke that statement. He says, um, Jesus knew their thoughts again and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And it's a very simple principle. He says, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? If Satan's plan is to divide God's kingdom, how is he accomplishing anything if he's casting out his own folks? You can't. If you are building a house and it has four corners and you take out one of the posts, is that house going to stand? Not for long. It's going to fall over. And that's all he was saying. He's like, look, a house divided against itself can't stand. Um, how many people are familiar with Abraham Lincoln quoting that passage? Um, he quoted that passage and used it in his speech at the Republican convention in his bid for presidency in 1858. And he was speaking before uh, the convention of over a thousand delegates and he used that exact passage and said he was speaking of the United States and he said a house divided against itself cannot stand and he said a nation divided amongst itself will not stand. And he was talking about the slavery issue. And he went on to say that the future of the United States is not going to continue in its current state. He said it's either going to fall or the slavery issue is going to have to be fixed. Because you can't have half one way, half the other. He said it's got to, got to be all or nothing. And, and that's what seated his nomination to the Republican Party. Um, to become president. But, so he used scripture um, and used what Jesus said here about a house divided against itself. He says, um, let me go back, I lost my place. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So he's saying, look, if it takes Beelzebub to drive out demons, and you guys are driving out demons, who are you using? Oh, he threw it right back in their face. And you would think they would eventually get it, but man, they were thick-headed. <laughs> but basically throw an egg right in their face, and they're not getting it. Um, it says... If by whom do your people drive them out, so then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. And can you imagine breaking into somebody's house and knowing they're going to be standing there with a loaded gun behind the door, you'd first want to make sure that man, one, is either not home <laughs> or two, he's incapacitated. Um, and that's what Jesus was saying. Look, 
you're not going to break into a strong man's house unless first you take care of the strong man. Um, he says, then you can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. And that's some hard words. They, I don't know if they realized it at the time and maybe took a step back, but they should have because they were actually slandering God at that point. They were saying, look, God is a demon and casting out demons. That's what they were saying that Jesus was doing. And he says, look, fellas, you've got to be careful with your words here because you're talking about something you don't realize. And he says, look, this anything slandering the spirit, that ain't coming off your record. That's not going to be forgiven. Um, he says, either in this age or the age to come. And he goes on to further elaborate. He says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? So man, he's really throwing it out there now because he's calling them, look, a bunch of snakes. <laughs> you snakes in the grass. Um, and what he's saying here in this little passage is so reminiscent of what his cousin said a few chapters earlier, John the Baptist, when the Pharisees confronted him when he was delivering his message of repent and be baptized. And he was baptizing many in the Jordan. Um, just a couple of chapters back, Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, and this is John the Baptist speaking, and he says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And he was looking directly at them and talking to these rulers. And that's where Jesus is right now, saying almost word for word what John was saying to him. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. He says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty or idle word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And that's a hard one to swallow too when you read it again and again, and you think to yourself, every idle word that you've ever said in your life, or thought, every idle word that you've ever said, thought, even if you said it under your breath, after somebody walked away, and he's going to call it to your remembrance, and he's going to say, remember saying this? Do you remember when you said this? And we're not going to be able to say no, <laughs> because it's going to be right there in front of us. And he says that we're going to have to give an account of that. Um, so he's, he's telling these guys, look, you're on thin ice, very thin ice. And he said, what you're accusing me and my father of is serious. And look, he's, he's trying to make it as easy for them to understand as possible. He's, you know, remember, this was what we call an agrarian society. It was an agricultural-based society, you know. People raised vineyards, they raised fruit trees, they raised gardens. 
um, all different kinds of produce. That was their livelihood, that was their life. So they understood agricultural references. And that's what he was getting to them with. And he said, look, if you make a tree good, if you plant it in good soil and you fertilize it and you water it, then it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It's go an apple tree is gonna give you good apples. A lemon tree is gonna give you good lemons. But if you don't, if you make that tree bad, if you plant it in bad soil, if you don't tend to it, if you don't prune it, if you don't fertilize it, you don't water it, what's it gonna do? It's not gonna give you good fruit. And he says, like any farmer would, if that tree does not produce good fruit, what happens to it? It gets cut down because what's it doing to the soil? It's using up the nutrients in the soil for nothing. It's not producing anything. So he's saying, look guys, you guys are the trees. What, what's inside you? What fruit is hanging from you? What, what can be picked off of you that's good? What's coming up out of your heart, your soil, that's good? What are you producing? And that's all of us, not just the Pharisees. What kind of fruit are we producing? Um, so then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So he just got done rebuking them for all of this stuff, and they're like, do a magic trick. Um, they just saw him heal a man, two men. They watched him heal a man's hand back to full health. They watched him heal a man who was demon-possessed, who could not talk, hear, or any of that. He was deaf and mute, and he was fully healed and could talk, carry on a conversation, just as good as you and me. And now they're saying, can you do a trick for us? Can you make a rabbit come out of a hat? That's basically what they were saying. They said, show us a sign. And he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And here he's speaking prophetically, of course. And remember, these guys are thick-headed. They're not getting it. They don't understand what he's saying. Do they know the story of Jonah? Oh, you bet. These guys knew the scriptures. That was their job. That, that's, they spent all of their life training forward and backward and learning it and reciting it and they had to memorize it and they knew all of this and yet they still were clueless. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the night and he was asking him all these questions and you know just how, how can this be? And Jesus looked at him and you know he, he loved him but he had to say to him, he said look aren't you a teacher of the law? Don't you know this? You, you've studied this all your life. How come you can't see it? What, what? He's like, where's the communication block here? And, but sometimes that's the problem, isn't it? Sometimes our knowledge gets in our way, doesn't it? And I think that's why he often uses the description that the kingdom of heaven is like a child. It's like the faith of a child. You know, and when a child is little and they look up at you and they ask you a question and you tell them, that's it. They're, they're done. Why is the sky blue and you can, you can tell them anything? Oh, because God threw some blue paint up in the sky and they'd be like, okay. And that, that, they believe it because they trust. They, they don't need to have all this knowledge get in the way. But we need to know the truth. And so we can let our knowledge get in the way of what truly matters. And these Pharisees had all this head knowledge. And it was just packed and crammed in there, man. And how many of you have ever heard some of the 
uh, I'll say derogatory, but they're not bad, but descriptions of what the initials mean after degrees. You've heard of BS, right? What, what else could a BS, a Bachelor of Science, mean? I'll leave it there. Or PhD, that means piled higher and deeper. So you get all this knowledge, all this head knowledge, and it's just crammed in there. But what good is it if you can't see through it? You've got blinders on now, and this is all you see. And all of that knowledge is all you can think about, but you don't even know what it means. You can't apply it. And I've said this many times before, but what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Knowledge is reading something and retaining it. You, you learn something. You learn how to add one plus one. You learn that the square peg goes in the square hole. You know these things. You learn these things. But wisdom is how you apply that knowledge. It's using it. It's not just storing it up here and having it all crammed in and mushed together. It's, it's how you use that knowledge. You can read a book all you want about how to change a tire. But until you actually physically change a tire, that's a different story, isn't it? it? So you have to be able to apply it. Knowledge is like the bucket of stain or the bucket of paint. And you can go buy a bucket of paint or stain, and you can bring it in here, and you can set it beside the wall. But what good is it doing if it stays in the bucket? It's not until that paintbrush is dipped in it and it's applied to where it belongs that that knowledge does any good. If it's in that bucket, what good is it doing? The Pharisees were the same way. They had all of that knowledge, but yet they could not see through themselves. They couldn't see Jesus for who he was. Um, that was their problem. He says that he's talking about how you're going to be given the sign of Jonah. He says he was three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. He says the Son of Man is going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, speaking of his death. That hadn't happened yet, but speaking of his crucifixion, burial, death, dead for three days in the heart of the earth. Um, he was buried. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. You know, Jonah had a message to deliver. God told him to go to Nineveh and deliver a message of repentance to this city and preach to them and tell them what I want them to do. I want them to stop what they're doing, turn around, honor me, repent. And because Jonah disobeyed him, of course, he had to go and go through his ordeal, but he eventually followed through. And what Jesus is saying is, look, the people of Nineveh were wicked. They were awful. And yet they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he says those people that repented are going to rise up at the judgment. And they're going to condemn you in this generation. Even though they had done far worse. But yet they were able to see and repent. And these guys can't. He says, he goes on, he says the queen of the south... Speaking of the Queen of Sheba, you remember the story from the Old Testament. Um, it says, the Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. So every reference that he's using, he's like, look, these were just things, these were road signs saying this way, pointing to me, pointing to Jesus. All of these things, the temple is Jesus. Jonah is Jesus. Solomon is Jesus. Everything's pointing right to him. And they know those scriptures like the back of their hand. And everything should have been pointing to the man standing right in front of them. And they could not see it. He says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, 
swept, clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. So let's stop and think about what he was describing there. I believe he was speaking literally. We can't see those things. Jesus can. And they're real. They're real today. And to deny it is to lie to yourself. There are still demons. There's still demon possession. It's not just Hollywood and movies. It really exists. And when Jesus cast out demons, he's explaining what happens on the inside. He says, that demon goes out, and the demon is looking for another place. Jesus has cast him out of this one, and he's looking for another place to go. Can't find one. And then he comes back, and he's like, well, I'll go back to the person I, I left. You know, that was a good place. And it says when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, everything put in order. But what happened? And you think, well, you mean to tell me when Jesus cast a demon out of somebody, that demon can't come back or can come back? Well, the problem lies with the person. Because if the person does not replace that empty spot with something, what does it do? It leaves a hole. What are we supposed to fill ourselves with? Even on Sunday when we come here, what are we supposed to be filled with? The Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be filling ourselves with God. We're supposed to be filling ourselves with his word. And when we don't, there's a void. There's an empty spot. And whatever there is left that's not filled with him, we're going to fill it with something else. We're going to put something else in there. We're going to cram this in. Or Satan is going to throw this idea in our mind. You know? Or Lord forbid, a demon is going to whisper in your ear. And, but it's because we leave ourselves open to these things. So that person that had the demon cast out, they didn't fill themselves with the Holy Spirit. They didn't fill themselves with God. And what was the command he gave people when he would heal them? What was the command he gave the woman who was brought to him in adultery? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. But what if she had left and sinned? Then that opens that door right back up to that, um, to take control of her life again. Um, verse 46, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? So the guys with him probably thought, Did he, is, is he lightheaded? Did, we need to get him some food and some water because he's asking who his mama is and his brothers and we all know who they are. How does he not know? But he says, Pointing to his disciples, whoops, but pointing to his disciples, he says, here's my mother and my brothers. He says, here they are, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, my brother, my sister. That, that's how it works. He's like, look around you. Everyone in this room is my mother, is my sister, is my brother. We're all together. He says, whoever does the will of my father, that's my brother and sister. That's my mama. And not just physical mother and father. Yes, we have physical mother and fathers here on the earth, don't we? And, you know, his mother and brothers were actually physically there looking for him, wanting to talk to him. And, but the good thing is we know that later on his brothers and his mother come to know and admit who he really is. We know that the book of James in the New Testament, that's Jesus' physical brother um, who wrote that book. And he became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. 
And so his brothers became, and even Jude uh, was one of Jesus' brothers. Um, so these guys eventually came to the knowledge that, yes, he was the son of God. He wasn't just the guy that we picked on in second grade, you know, or he wasn't the guy we threw rocks at or tripped in the garden. Um, he was God. He was God's son. He was, we grew up with him, but he was God. And so Jesus is saying, look, this is how we should be. These people surrounded me is our family. We're all family. So how is the church related to that? Not this building, but every one of you. Is this your mother? Is this your brother? Is this your sister? Are they your family? Everyone in this room, everyone in any church, any church that there is, it's not just the building, it's the people. And so Jesus is reaffirming that, that look, the people who do the will of my father, that's my family. That, that's, that's my kin. That's who I love. And he's just saying, be like them. That's my mother and my father. So next week, um, chapter 13, are you going to be here, Tim? Yes. Okay. Another big chapter. Um, I think that one's almost 60 verses. <laughs> um, but it's a very good one. Jesus continues preaching. Um, but many, many parables <laughs> in next week's. The whole thing is about parables. But... Um, very familiar ones, but he continues with his agricultural references um, so that the farmers of the day and the farmers of today will understand what he's talking about. So let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for giving us the advantage of hindsight. We should feel so blessed that we live in a day and time where we have the complete story of your life, and everything that happened laid out before us. We have all of the story and your scripture at our disposal, and we have no excuse for not knowing or understanding it. Lord, we should know it. We shouldn't let our head knowledge get in the way of our heart knowledge. Lord, help us to be able to take what was before us today. Lord, help us to apply it. Help us to dip that paintbrush into the word and lord help us to use those brush strokes throughout our daily walk with you lord help us to apply it to our lives each and every day and lord it's in your son's name we pray amen